I'm Quaylen Nassar. Everyone's talking about it. It's the book, it's the movie, it's the Da Vinci Code. So what was the relationship between Christ and Mary Magdalene? Father John Abdullah, Dean of St. George Orthodox Cathedral, will be talking to one of the foremost theologians in Orthodoxy today, Father Tom Hopko. We've been delighted to have him do a series of programs with us, and the Da Vinci Code is on the topic today. He's the Dean Emeritus of St. Vladimir Seminary of Crestwood, New York, has written countless publications, books, and articles. So, do you want another perspective on the Da Vinci Code? Here it is. Father Tom, there's so much buzz about this Da Vinci Code and the relationship between uh, Mary and Jesus. What really was the relationship between them? Well, what really was? Obviously, there's lots of interpretations about that. Uh, and there are even um, uh, in the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, you have different images and different pictures of the relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And I think it's really important uh, to, right from the beginning, to say two things if a person is going to read the Da Vinci Code. One would be to really know what do the four canonical Gospels say. I'm afraid that so many people are discussing this without having the foggiest idea of what is actually recorded in the Gospels and why it's there, what, it, what is trying to be told in the Gospel story. Then you have a second thing, and the second thing is various traditions about Mary Magdalene uh, and who she was and who she may have been subsequent to the death and, of Jesus and uh, his being raised from the dead. And, and here there are, there are great differences. So you have real differences between, uh, about, uh, among Christians about, first of all, the interpretation of Mary in the scriptures, and then the subsequent legendary traditional histories about her afterwards. And I think it's really important uh, for us Orthodox folks to discuss this because uh, our interpretation of, that, of the whole story uh, this is one of the places where it's really different uh, from uh, the traditions that grew up in Western, uh, in Western Christianity. So what did the first century church believe? Well, I think that if you, take the, if you take the four Gospels, Mary Magdalene is in all four. And, and not everything is in all four Gospels. So this is very important, that she's a figure who is found in, in each of the four Gospels that classical Orthodox Christians from the earliest time till today consider to be the right story about Jesus. You see, the truth about Jesus. Because mm -hmm. there are plenty of stuff written all over. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a minute. Have to. Uh, but these four Gospels were considered to be according to what was called the canon of faith, the traditions, the apostolic traditions of, of the church. And they were canonized, meaning they were given the seal of approval. Now, Mary is in all four of them. Uh, and um, in all four, there are, are, are three things that are said about here that totally agree. One is that she was one of the women, chief women disciples of Jesus. She followed him with the other women. And in Luke's gospel, the eighth chapter, she's among those named who ministered unto him. And here, I'd just like to say a point about this. This is very important. Because some traditions <clears throat> identify Mary, Magdalene, with the woman in the seventh chapter of Luke's gospel, the fallen woman, the prostitute, yes. who, who washes Jesus' feet. But it's so interesting, you have that whole story of the woman washing Jesus' feet, then it goes into the women who followed him, and it mentions Mary. And it mentions there, as in Mark's gospel, but in Mark's it's at the end, that she was one whom Jesus healed, uh, out of whom it said went seven demons, which in the language of the time that meant she was really messed up. <laughs> okay. You see, she was really a troubled uh, person. Sure. But it's interesting that when they list the women, they don't say, and Mary Magdalene, who we just referred to as washing uh, Jesus' feet with her tears. And they so would have done so, but they didn't. So it's a different it's Mary. A different, it's a different person. And in, and in Luke 7 the name of that person is not given. It doesn't say what her name was. Mm. However, <laughs> where some confusion comes in and, and, and needing to, to kind of interpret the story is that in Matthew and Mark's gospel, there's a very similar story at the end of the gospel 
about a, about a woman, again, not named, who washes Jesus' feet with her tears and anoints him for burial. Uh, and, and in the Luke story, um, she, uh, the woman anoints his feet. In the Matthew, it's his head. And then, in, and then in John again, it's his feet. I mean, you could talk about why that might be. But what's interesting is that they don't name her. It just says, wherever the gospel is preached in all the world, this will be told in memory of her. But then John's gospel comes along. And in John's gospel, this woman who anoints Jesus for burial before his death is named. She's named as Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who in John's gospel, Jesus raises from the dead, and the sister of Martha. And Martha and Mary are mentioned in Luke's gospel, but there's nothing about the brother Lazarus. So what happened was some tradition, some, in fact, the Western Christian tradition, actually thinks in its legendary material that Mary Magdalene was Lazarus' sister. Now, in our tradition, that is not the case. There are, there are several Marys. Now, the other thing that's said about Mary Magdalene, beside um, uh, being one of the women disciples, in our tradition, she is not the one who, who, who washes uh, uh, Jesus' feet with her tears and anoints him. She's not, it's very clear that that is not Mary person. Magdalene. It's a different person. Now, what is said about Mary Magdalene, however, in all four Gospels, is that she witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says the women who followed him were standing far away. They were looking from afar. They didn't yes. come up close. And among them were named Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, Mary, wife of Cleopas. Then there was the mother of Zebedee's children. Then there was someone named Joanna, someone named Susanna. Uh, we don't know who actually much sure. about them. But what's interesting that is in John's gospel, she's standing close to the cross with Jesus' mother Mary. It says standing at the foot of the cross was Jesus' mother Mary and Mary Magdalene. So she's really a prominent character. I mean, she's a witness to the end. And then in all four Gospels, she's a witness of, uh, of um, the risen Christ. Well, to be more accurate, in Mark, in the first account, she witnesses the empty tomb. Mm -hmm. The Christ doesn't, doesn't appear to her. But she's the first one to find that the tomb, well, the myrrh bearers generally, sure. was empty. Mm -hmm. And she goes back and tells the apostles. And, but in John's gospel, she's there by the tomb wondering what happens to Jesus, weeping because she thinks that maybe they've stolen his body away because the tomb is empty. And then in John's gospel, Jesus appears to her, and they have a rather long conversation. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, so, Father Tom, you mentioned you referenced her as a disciple. Oh, yes. Would you say a little bit more about that? I don't think we're, we're, oh, yeah. we're used to hearing any more than the 12 disciples. Well, it's very interesting. In the, in the eighth chapter of Luke, it said, uh, after the story of the fallen woman, it says, and Jesus went around preaching, and with him were the 12, and disciple simply means student or follower, yes. devotee, Sure. Uh, the 12, and then in Luke's gospel, the 12 are named. Yes. And then it says, and also some women whom he had healed, among whom were Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene, from yes. whom seven demons had gone out. And then he names Susanna, Joanna, uh, and others. Now, in our tradition, these are even called technically the women disciples of the Lord. And these women disciples are, in, are, are terrifically important. Why? Not only because Jesus had women disciples, although we always point out the apostles technically were only men. There were no women among the apostles. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes people could even, you know, that's debated too, and, and it might even be asked, why not? Well, one of the uh, interesting points here is that a woman at that time could not be a legal witness. The testimony of a woman could not hold up in court. Okay. So if someone was going to be a legal witness, and witness became a very important word in Christian history. Mm -hmm. In Greek, it's martis. Martyria means testimony or witness. When we think of a martyr, we think of someone who got killed. Sure. You know, but it usually means being killed by what they were convinced about. And their death witnessing and to their the death. truth. 
their blood like testifying. But technically, the language of testimony and witness, which, by the way, in St. John's Gospel is used over 90 times, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a legal thing, uh, a legal um, uh, concept saying, I'm ready to die for this. If I'm lying, I'm perjuring. You know, I mean, it, it was a technical thing. Uh, but the woman could not, not bear witness. But what's interesting and very ironic, I mean, Christianity is filled with these ironies. I, I always think, by the way, I can never think of Mary Magdalene without thinking that the very first witness of the risen Christ was a woman out of whom he cast seven demons. The first guy to go to heaven was a thief hanging on a cross. The, the greatest of the di disciples who was the leader of the apostles, Peter, was the one who denied him. And Paul was actually persecuting the early church, killing the first martyr, Stephen, and he ends up the chief apostle. Whitehead said that the Bible has no sense of humor. I mean, if that's not the sense of humor, sure. I don't know what is. The mysteries of God. Yeah. Right. We'll come back to this a little bit more, but first we're going to hear a witness of a woman who lives a life of witness as a, uh, as a monastic and who carries the name of Mary Magdalene. So that's pretty exciting. And then we'll be back to talk a little bit more about the Da Vinci Code and some of its ramifications. Why cannot a woman be ordained a priest in the Orthodox Church? The Orthodox do not argue against the ordination of women on the grounds of the priest being another Christ, or that no woman should rule over a man. We simply feel that there are not sufficient theological grounds to change the long-standing tradition of ordaining only men as priests and bishops. Mother Magdalena is from the Monastery of the Transfiguration in Elwood City, and thank you so much for being with us today. You were named after Mary Magdalene. How did that come about? In the Orthodox tradition, when a man or a woman takes their final vows, then um, they receive a new name. And I was named after Magda I was given the name Magdalena uh, for a couple of reasons. One is because we wanted that saint to be more present in the life of our monastery and also because the founders of our monastery, her mother was named Marie, she was Queen Marie of Romania, and so I was also named after her, so it's like a family name in the monastery. And so here we are saying that we <coughs> wanted that saint mm -hmm. to become more, you know, more visible, right. yes. and uh, Father Hopko was very clear in saying Mary Magdalene was not a harlot. Yes. Now, when, you, when we look at all of that, what are your personal feelings about what is being said about Mary Magdalene in the Da Vinci Code? Well, the story between, uh, the, of Mary Magdalene and Christ at the tomb, at the empty tomb, is an incredibly beautiful love story. And <clears throat> so often in our, in our culture today, that kind of love story that has that purity to it, it's very difficult for people to want to maintain, to keep that purity, they have to sully it. And I'm very, I feel very sad about what's happened with, with uh, St. Mary in the, in the Da Vinci Code, because I think that's what's happened. Something that's so pure has been dirtied. And so they think that just because there's this love, it had to be a romantic love yes. and not Therefore, just... And it had to be a sexual love. And it couldn't be just the pure love of a woman for her, her teacher, her master. As, as so many people have. Yeah. What lessons in life do you think we can learn from St. Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene has very much to teach us. Uh, she was the first to, to witness, to see the risen Christ. And so one of the things she has to teach us is that Christ, the resurrection is real. And it can be real in our lives also, so that we can also encounter Christ as, as a risen Christ. Um, another uh, thing that she has to teach us is how to seek him. She sought him. She followed him through all the crowds that he was constantly being surrounded by. She followed him through the mobs that were, that were demanding his life. She followed him to the cross when he died, which for her in her life, because she didn't know about the resurrection, was an utter disaster. She followed him to the tomb, where as far as she was concerned, it was done. He was dead. It was, it was, there was nothing more to live for. She followed him and then to the tomb, and she stayed at the tomb until she saw him. And so she was able, in, in our own lives, we can follow him through the noise and bustle of our lives. We can follow him when <clears throat> everything seems to get bad. We can follow him when our lives are just an utter disaster, when everything is, seems to have fallen apart, when even God seems to be silent in our life. She teaches us, just stay with him, and he will show us the way he'll come to us, and he'll redeem that, whatever that 
trial is for us. That's a really beautiful piece to take from, from who she was. She was a disciple. I mean, she was <coughs> part she of was, the many. Yes, yeah, she was one of his closest disciples, a, a woman who followed him and gave her, gave her entire life. And after the resurrection, she continued to be an apostle. She, was a, uh, she continued to, to preach. Do you feel you have a special relationship with her? I do. Um, I feel like she, she and I have now been acquainted. And I pray to her every day. Uh, and I have specific things that I pray to her to help me, to help me learn. And that's been helpful <clears throat> for you? Very much so. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us and for joining us today. Okay. And we're going to be talking a, lip, a bit more with Father Tom Hopko and Father John Abdella about the Da Vinci Code. Why must a priest be married before he is ordained? In fact, he must be married before he is ordained deacon. This is to ensure that those who must guide others in married life have already settled down in their own lives. Similarly, a person should not properly be ordained a priest until he is at least 30 years old. Mother Magdalena is quite a teacher. It's good to be back to uh, talk about this. Father, Father Tom, uh, Mary Magdalene was an apostle? Yes, uh, Mother Magdalena said that, and that's very important because she's not only a disciple, leading disciple, but as the first witness of the risen Christ, She's also called in the scripture and in our church services an apostle. In fact, she's given the title equal to the apostles. There are several women who have that title, Thecla and others in the early church. And the reason is because uh, she was sent. The word apostle means the one who was sent. She was sent to tell the men <laughs> that Jesus was risen from the dead, that the tomb was empty, that she had seen him. In fact, in the Latin church, St. Ambrose was one of our saints. He called her Apostola Apostolorum, the Apostle of the Apostles. <laughs> so she was an Apostle, and as, and as uh, Mother said, the tradition is that she continued not only to be a witness, a martyr, uh, and a disciple, but an Apostle, a preacher, uh, uh, um, uh, sent to witness to the crucified, risen Christ, which is very different, by the way, from the other so-called Gospels that existed at the time, even those that are used in the Da Vinci Code. Those, those um, Gnostic Gospels or secret Gospels or rejected Gospels, or uh, would you tell us a little bit about them? That yeah, they... sure. Uh, some folks <clears throat> think that, that these uh, writings that are called Gospels, like the Gospel of Philip, that's one that Dan Brown uses in the book, or there's one called Gospel of Truth. Uh, there's a, a very famous one that uh, a Princeton scholar, Elaine Pagels, made uh, famous, The Acts of Thomas. There are many of those. Well, some people think that this is all brand new, newly discovered, that they were hidden and, and uh, uh, suppressed. Well, they were very well known in the early church. I mean, Irenaeus, St. Irenaeus, he writes about them, Epiphanius. Uh, but they were judged by the tradition of Christianity that virtually all mainline Christian churches hold up to the present day. Most, all Orthodox and Catholics, most Protestants, would hold that, that, um, that there was a canon of faith, a teaching of faith in the early church, and that these other writings were philosophical or spiritualistic or sometimes even fantastic writings sure. about Jesus and the story. Mm -hmm. uh, just now before Easter this year, the so-called, I think it was called Gospel of Judas or the yes. Acts of Judas came out. Sure. Well, these are not new. They were known. What, what is new is that they're, they're being translated into English, marketed, Yes. and popularized in books like, uh, like the Da Vinci Code. Sure. But, but they were known, and they were judged to simply be fantasy, to be, to be uh, not true. And, and there's two, there are two um, uh, points that really make these so-called Gnostic or hidden secret Gospels different from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first is, and even the teachings of St. Paul. Sure. And that is that in the classical, orthodox, Catholic, evangelical Christian tradition, there are two things that are insisted about Jesus. He was really incarnate as a human being, the Messiah of Israel. Mm -hmm. But he was divine also. Mm -hmm. 
So he wasn't just a divine spirit or something that indwelled people or, or a self-realized man. He was God's son. The second thing is that he was really crucified. He was put to death in the most vile death you could die. And that his death and resurrection were prophesied in what the Gospels and generally the New Testament writings call the Scriptures. And that meant the law, the Psalms, the prophets of what we Christians call the Old Testament. So there were, there were the, 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 the real Jesus, we believe, the real Jesus, uh, was a real man, God's Son, crucified, raised, and glorified, according to the law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets. Now, in the Gnostic Gospels, this is not the case. They are not according to Scripture. There's no crucifixion in any of them, <laughs> which is the heart of classical Christianity. And they all have to do with inner experience, my feelings about God or my self-realization. Well, you see, and that's what you find like in Philip, the one of Philip that's quoted in the Da Vinci Code. Sure. So at a time when, when books needed to be hand-copied, a book that was philosophical and of not much use perhaps didn't get copied too often. Well, it got copied. I mean, they were all copied. We have copies of all of this. Uh, you see, it is true. One thing that is true is that <clears throat> there was a time when classical Christianity became the established religion. That is true. I mean, Dan Brown in The Da Vinci Code is simply totally inaccurate when he speaks about Constantine being the one who invented Jesus as the Son of God and sure. the Nicene Council. Th those things are just factually inaccurate, what he writes. Mm -hmm. However, what is true is that from the earliest time, Jesus was confessed as God's Son, really the Son of God, incarnate in human flesh. It, it says in the New Testament writings that we hold as true, anyone who doesn't confess that he really became in flesh is an antichrist. Well, the Gnostics didn't claim that he... Re it's, it's ironic, because on the one hand, the Gnostics claim he didn't really come in flesh, he was some type of aeon or spirit. On the other hand, they have him marrying Mary Magdalene. You yes. see, you know. Yes. So, and of so, course, according to the, to, to the scriptures and tradition of, of classic Christianity, Jesus was not married to Mary Magdalene. She was not a prostitute, but she was not Jesus' wife either. Right. You know? Why is it important for us to uh, understand that Jesus is not the wife of one person? Well, you know, it's interesting that about 30 years ago, a professor from Union Seminary in New York wrote an article saying Jesus must have been married. He didn't say he was married to Mary Magdalene. He said he must have been married because a rabbi at that time could not be single. Celibacy wasn't involved. You had to have children. You had to have this raise up seed. Mm -hmm. Now, even that is kind of strange because Elijah was not married John the Baptist was not married. We know now from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which, by the way, that's where they got these so-called Gospels, that the Essenes were celibate very often. They were not married. So we learned a lot right. from the Dead Sea Scrolls. These scholars want it both ways. Yeah, but this guy wrote that Jesus was married, and I'll never forget because a woman came to me in church on Sunday with a clipping from the New York Times saying, look, some scholar claimed Jesus was married, you know. And then she said to me, he wasn't, was he, Father, you know. And so I just had fun with her, and I said, you tell me. And she said, well, of course he wasn't. And I fooled her, and I said, of course he was. And she said, he was? I said, yes. She said, who is his wife? I said, you are and I am and the whole world is. Because in the scripture, the first title of Jesus is the bridegroom. We Orthodox sing about that during Holy Week. But his wife is not only fallen Israel. His wife are the Gentiles and the whole, the whole of humankind. So Jesus is the husband of the church. And Christian marriage is patterned uh, by St. Paul on the relation of Jesus and the church. A husband is supposed to be the head of his wife like Christ, and that means get crucified for her, die for her. And the wife is supposed to become one flesh with her husband like the church is one flesh with Jesus in his risen body and in the Holy Eucharist and so on. So marriage is very affirmed. And, and when Mother Magdalena uh, said about the Da Vinci Code that they couldn't understand pure marriage, we want to be careful there a little bit that we don't think that marriage is bad. It's not evil. But for the Son of God, the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world, to have one woman as his actual spouse and produce children is contrary to the whole scopus of Holy Scripture uh, because the uniqueness of the Son of God 
uh, is that he somehow embraces us all. And Mary Magdalene is a perfect example of someone totally in love with Jesus, as Mother Magdalena said, but not in the sense of being his earthly spouse. <laughs> you know, Fantastic. You know. <laughs> Fantastic. So right. we see Mary Magdalene as an example for us. We see uh, Mary Magdalene's example proving right. to us that Jesus is indeed the Word of God who took on flesh and marries and embraces this creation and shows us the oneness of God exactly. that we're all called to. In, in the Da Vinci Code, they use Acts, the Gospel of Philip, and there's a fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls about how Jesus would kiss her. And there were missing words, and Brown supplies kissing her on the mouth and this sure. and this. But that's, first of all, it's not in the text but that they greeted each other with a holy kiss, mm -hmm. that they kissed each other. When, in the scripture, when it says that Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, and he came and saluted them, well, in, in Greek, it says he kissed them. And we Orthodox like to kiss each other all the time. We're always kissing. You've got to be careful nowadays. That's right. But, People will but have kissing wrong ideas. was not always understood as, you know, sexual intercourse or something like that, you know. Fantastic. <laughs> right? yeah. Father Tom, thank you so much for being right. with us once again. Thank you. Well, now you've just heard a very perspective of Mary Magdalene and how she's viewed in orthodoxy. That's right, Quaylen. Saint Mary Magdalene was a disciple and apostle. She was not married to Jesus, and she certainly wasn't a prostitute. And if you'd like to learn more about Orthodoxy, you can listen to WEDO Radio on uh, Wednesday mornings at 9.30 on 8.10 a.m. on your radio dial. Or if you have a question, you could write to us at this address. And don't forget, watch Orthodoxy Now here on the Christian Associates channel, channel 95 in the city of Pittsburgh, and on Comcast On Demand. I'm Quayle Nassar with Father John Abdullah. Thank you for joining us.